Hello, everyone, and welcome to confirmation this uh, Wednesday, January 27th. And we just wrapped up our fellowship and prayer time, and so we're going to jump into our lesson here, and we're going to pick off, pick up where we left off last week, which is in looking at some of the claims that Jesus was making in his earthly ministry. And we talked about how Jesus, in preceding weeks, we talked about how we know Jesus was a real person, right? Historians who weren't Christians wrote about Jesus outside of the Bible. Josephus wrote about him. And um, so we, we know from that and from other sources that Jesus was a, a real person in real history. And the Gospels give us an account of what Jesus did and his person and work and, and his life, his mission, his ministry, how he acted and behaved, how he treated people, what sorts of things he said, um, what he said about himself, and how he viewed his mission from God. And uh, so we're going to be looking a little bit more at that, um, because some people will say, well, Jesus didn't really claim these things. You know, Christians have just made all that stuff up. But we can look at the Gospels and say, no, he really did claim these things. And so we have to take that seriously. Nina, did you have a question? Um, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, for this, are we already on the Messiah, uh, the Messianic age has come, the verdict, or are we Not still picking up with the 13th one? Not quite. We are finishing up 13. And I'll tell you guys um, where we're at. Um, I believe last time we finished up the section called recognition on that worksheet in the, the 13 packet. And so that should be page, um, we should be at the bottom of page 45. It, on my page, um, it shows like, because I have the notes on it, mm -hmm. that we, we also did the, we finished the, or we start, no, we started the radical reinterpretation. Yeah. And so, so are, like, are we, like, done with that one, or are we still going to work on that one? Um, we're not quite done with that one. I wanted to hit some more points with that. And, um, Wes, for some reason, it, I'm assuming that's you bringing the chat up. It won't let me see the chat. So did you have a question or was somebody else typing in there? Um, I did type a question. And so we're supposed to have like a um, sheet printed out. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I sent a, a worksheet. Tell you what, if, um, if you don't have that right now, um, that's okay. You can just kind of pay attention. And if you want to write down some things on scratch paper, if you want to take a minute to go get a pencil and paper, we can do that. Um, and for the, the sections we did before, don't worry about that. You and I, um, I talked with your mom. We'll cover that later, OK? OK. I probably have it in my email. I just haven't printed it out. Yeah, no worries. Um, if you just want to take notes right now, um, and I'll kind of because we'll go through the questions and answers right now together. And so you can just write down the exact things that um, you'd be, that the others would be writing down too. Okay. So uh, while Wes is doing that, just a reminder here that um, Jesus' birth, you know, we're in the year 2021, right? And just to give you guys a reference point here, Jesus was probably born somewhere around 6 BC, give or take a year. And um, he, his crucifixion probably took place somewhere around the year 30 AD, give or take a couple of years there. Um, so Jesus was in his 30s there. Um, and that kind of gives you a little bit of a reference point of when all this is taking place in history. All right, and as you guys know, don't steal any of these things. They're all the FBI warnings and stuff. Um, and 
you also know that we've been looking at the messianic age um, and the, the claims that Jesus made there. So um, last time we talked a little bit about the two different types of religions in the world, if you guys remember that. And just by way of review, because this is going to come up in the section of radical reinterpretation that we're looking at. What are the two different religions in the world? Yes, Emma. Um, so there's the religion where like the man like has to work up to God. Um, and like where it says on the notes, like the man serves God. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the other religion, which is Christianity, um, God like comes to us. He he forgives us. He answers all of our prayers. So like it says on the notes on the side, it says God serves us. So it's completely opposite than the other religion. Excellent. Very good. And uh, just for Wes's sake, because he, he wasn't here last time, we we're saying despite the fact that there are tons of different religions out in the world, some people say, we can kind of look at all religions, Wes, and say, actually, there are only two basic types. There are the types where man has to earn or work our way up to God and to his good graces. And then there's Christianity where God shows grace to us. And then rather than us having to go up to God, God comes down to us in Jesus. And we see that all throughout scripture. Um, and so God actually serves us. He's a servant king. And that's pretty cool. And um, if you want, you can go back and look at this video again later or and look at this, this slide here. But you can see how Christianity is just the complete opposite of all of these other um, all these other religions there. And that's kind of special. It kind of tells us Christianity is different, that maybe it's worth paying attention to. If it's the only religion in the world that um, presents God in this way, that sets it apart. That's worth paying attention to. Very good. So um, looking at our section on radical reinterpretation, uh, Jesus in his life and ministry, he gets to a point where he starts interacting with the religious leaders of Israel quite a bit. He starts talking with the Pharisees and the, the scribes and the Sadducees and all these people that are in, in charge of the, the Jewish high court, the Sanhedrin, um, and all their leaders, and they didn't like Jesus a whole lot, like we talked about um, for reasons we discussed last time some. And Jesus kind of starts to call them out and say, guys, you've missed the point, right? Going back to our previous slide, you've built up religion into a system where you're working your way up to God. And you've forgotten about the ways that God comes down to us um, and how our religion is a, and how scripture presents God as being merciful, right? And kind and compassionate and loving. And instead they've kind of, they flipped the script a little bit. And so Jesus kind of starts pointing out some of the ways that they've missed the point um, and that their religious system has really gotten pretty messed up. And he accuses them of manipulating some of the laws of God to avoid obeying them. Um, and how even though on the outside, it seems like they're doing everything right, inside their hearts, their motivations are kind of crummy. They're not good. And they've got a lot of anger and deceit and slander and all sorts of those things on the inside. So we're going to go ahead and actually look up one of those passages um, so let's go ahead, and if you have a Bible with you, we can go ahead and look up Mark chapter 7. And pretty much all our passages today, if not all of them, are going to be in Mark. So let's look up Mark chapter 7, verses 1 through 13. You guys need a minute to find a Bible? Okay, I saw Wes made a run for it, went and grabbed it. I'm assuming Wes, or Wit, sorry. Um, I'm assuming Wes 
went to grab one real quick too. So we'll wait just a minute. There we go. So I'll go ahead and, and read this first one for us. But uh, Jesus is meeting with the Pharisees and it says, now when the, the Pharisees gathered to him with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, they saw that some of Jesus' disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands properly holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions that they observe, such as the washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why do your disciples not walk according to the traditions of the elders, but eat uh, with defiled hands? And, uh, Jesus says, and here he calls him out pretty harshly. He says, well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honors me with their lips, meaning they say the right things, but their heart is far from me. So they say the right things with their words, but their hearts aren't really in it. And Jesus says, in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. So they're making up commandments as if it's for, from God. Um, and he goes, he goes on from there, but you get an, an idea there um, of some of the conversations they had. So how does Jesus feel about saying the right things with your, your mouth um, if your heart is not in it? Yeah, Emma. Um, well, kind of like based off of like, um, like the answer that I wrote last week, um, it's kind of kind of like what you just said, but like what it's what Jesus teaches is like that whatever comes out of your um, wait comes out of your heart are unclean. I think that like that's what I wrote, but I don't know if like that's right, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's, um, so if you could put that into your own words, kind of what you were just saying about what comes out of your heart there, because you're, you're on the right track. Oh, I was just taking them from our last week's notes, like what my answer was. Yeah. So, um, so like, um, so you're like, well whatever. Connected. You're right. So like whatever you say and like it, that all comes from your heart and what comes from your heart is unclean and is like sinful because we are sinful people. Mm -hmm. And like that, that is the reason that uh, Jesus died on the cross for us. But since like what comes out of our heart, which are the words we say, the thoughts that we have, they're all unclean. Mm-hmm. Like yeah, and, yeah and and yeah i'm glad you you made that connection that's good and um and it's not that everything that um we do as christians is unclean right or as believers is unclean um but nina had another thought do you want to say something nina um, I was thinking like what comes of, out of your heart is really what counts what comes out of your mouth isn't that could just be flattery you know very good yeah so if I could kind of rephrase that or summarize it um, what comes out of your what's in your heart matters more than the words that you speak right because if you're just faking it then ultimately what's inside matters more and that's kind of part of what Jesus is getting at here, is that um, the Pharisees and religious leaders had lost sight of loving their neighbors and helping other people and, and loving God um, and faith in God. They didn't, they didn't trust God there. They're trying to work their way up to him. Um, and that, that's important, too, because if you guys come across other religions 
or not necessarily other religions. Um, sometimes you just come across people and they say, oh, in order to get on God's good side, you've got to um, do this fast from food, right? Or you've got to pray a certain prayer. Um, and if you don't say these words, or if you don't pray enough, or if you don't do enough, um, and all these different things, right? Then, um, then you, God's not going to have favor on you. And uh, we're seeing there that, okay, ultimately what matters more than all of that is having faith and trust in God. And um, God doesn't care as much about um, this sort of um, flattery, right? He doesn't need us to flatter him and just to pretend to do all these things to get on the good side. Because if you're going to be doing all that, you're probably doing it out of fear too. You're not really doing it out of faith. And God would rather that we have faith in our hearts. And sometimes those things aren't bad. It's not bad to pray um, or to do good things. But ultimately, what if you don't believe it in your heart there, um, then it's not, not important there. And you can go, to, and this also means you can go to church every Sunday, right? And some people think, well, I don't really believe it, but I'll go to church every Sunday. And I get, it's kind of like an insurance policy. It's a safety net. Um, and so I, I'll just go and God, God will be obligated then to have favor on me. Um, does that make sense? You guys can nod there. Okay. So yeah, I think, what, I think what I meant in my, in my notes was that Jesus teaches the things that come out of my, like come out of our mouths are unclean, not our heart. I think I just got that mixed up. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and so, no, and that's okay. Um, I actually, I liked what you said before, Emma, that ultimately what, whatever comes out of our mouth is going to be a reflection of what's in our heart, right? And so nothing's going to come out of our mouth that wasn't already in our heart. Um, and what you were saying, Emma, is that, you know, in this life, even as Christians, we still have sin. And so there's going to be some unclean, nasty stuff that comes out of our heart. And that's why Jesus came to die. And we need to, to recognize all that, that we can look nice and pretty and shiny and clean on the outside, right? But if we don't get our hearts taken care of, our, our, you know, because our hearts are sick, we don't get our hearts taken care of and we don't get our sins forgiven by Jesus, then we've got a problem. And, then, and that's what Jesus is kind of calling out the Pharisees on there. All right, so we'll go ahead and keep moving along there, uh, but I want to look up real quickly um, Mark 12, because Jesus gets into this interesting conversation. In Mark 12, verses 28 through 33, Jesus gets into another conversation with the scribe, and this one is a little more positive. Um, and uh, it says here, one of the scribes came up and heard Jesus and uh, heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well, asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? And Jesus answered, the most important is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So the first and greatest commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. And the second is love your neighbor as yourself. And when you compare that to some of the things the Pharisees were upset about before, they're trying to keep all the commandments, but then they're upset about Jesus healing somebody. Well, Jesus is saying, you guys are getting totally lost because what's the second greatest commandment? Love your neighbor. And how is healing someone not loving them? Um, and so if we, we keep focused on those two commandments, 
that helps us out quite a bit. Any thoughts, um, or comments, or questions on those? Um, for the love, like love your neighbor as yourself, it kind of, I don't know if it's the same commandment, but it reminds me of the one I just memorized, mm -hmm. um, which is the 10th commandment, uh, you shall not covet your neighbors, um, and to summarize it, any of their belongings. And it kind of reminded me like, um, you wouldn't want any of you, like anyone to like force away any of your belongings. And so like loving your neighbor is like, you shouldn't do that to them, like how you wouldn't want that to happen to you. Excellent connection, Emma. Fantastic. And if you can kind of file that away for, um, you know, like when we do our examination stuff, and that's the sort of thing you can bring that up. Um, that would be a fantastic connection because um, it's a, the commandments really are all about loving, um, loving God with all our heart and mind and soul and strength and about loving our neighbors. So wonderful. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, Wes, go ahead. Um, kind of like, like Emma said. And it reminds me of the rule in kindergarten where, where it was like, don't, don't steal kids' stuff if you don't want them to steal yours. Basically, do on to others as you would want them to do on to you. Exactly. Yeah, and that's the golden rule, and that's taken from Scripture there. Um, and it's ultimately a rule of, of love. And so... When you look at it that way, when God says, well, don't murder someone and don't steal and, and all that sort of stuff and don't covet what they have, he's not saying it so that um, he can be a big meanie, right? He's not just trying to um, squash any fun you might have had. He wants to help us love our neighbors, love each other. And that's why those commandments are in place. So very good, guys. Excellent. So uh, another aspect of Jesus' radical reinterpretation here, um, and this is uh, letter B under radical reinterpretation, which just kind of asks about Jesus eating with other people, right? It was pretty common then. Um, you only really ate with people that you thought were kind of in your social circle or socially acceptable. And so you wouldn't eat with people that you didn't like. And so Jews would not eat with Samaritans or with Gentiles, with non-Israelites. Um, and they had, and that's not because that was in scripture necessarily, right? Um, they were supposed to maintain some ritual observances about uh, remaining clean for festival days and things like that and ritual purity. But you also have passages like um, Isaiah 25 that talks about God preparing a banquet, a feast for all people of all nations everywhere. And so it's not that God had wanted to exclude people, quite the opposite. But then Jesus comes in and he's accused in Luke of being a friend of sinners because so often he's eating with sinners and with the tax collectors and kind of the nobodies or the, the no-gooders. Um, and he's eating with Gentiles even at different points um, and uh, meeting with the woman at the well, for example, and talking with her, even though she's a Samaritan. And so Jesus um, actions there show us that God's kingdom is for all people. Uh, and he dines with those that the religious elites thought were nobodies. Um, and so that's kind of how he flips the script there. And I think I said there um, a moment ago that Jesus dines with Gentiles. And now I'm, I'm actually thinking, I don't know that that's true. Um, but he definitely d dines with, with sinners. He meets the woman at the well. Um, and he shows his, his love and compassion for all people. So taking all that into account, how would you describe Jesus or God's kingdom? If you guys, I want each of you to think of one adjective, like a one or two word adjective um, to describe how Jesus treats people, 
what what he's like um, or what his kingdom is like. We'll just take volunteers to go first. Yeah, Emma. Um, well, I would think like it kind of shows that like Jesus, since he is the Messiah, um, it, it shows like that he is trying to get the people who think that sinners are horrible and they're like, and they've done so many things wrong and, and whatever bad happens to them is because they or their parents did something bad to kind of get that, I guess, karma to happen. Mm -hmm. um, but like, I think God or Jesus is trying to like prove I mean, he, he doesn't have to prove anything to them, but I think he's trying to like show them like, um, like they're all sinners. It's not just the people who have leprosy or are blind. It's everyone. And I think he's just trying to like show them that they're sinners too. And like that everyone should eat with everyone. And it's, it shouldn't be too, it shouldn't be like a couple separate different like groups, I guess. Very well said. So we all have a sin problem. All human beings, except for Jesus, have a, we're all sick with sin. And so when we realize that, then nobody is really better than anyone else, right? We're all, we all can kind of be humbled by that because we all need God's forgiveness. Very good. Nina. Um, I picked a couple adjectives, welcoming and forgiving. Welcoming because, and forgiving, yeah. Because no matter like how much of a sinner you are, if you accept God's gift of grace, you'll get into heaven and be with him. So Very good. That mine. Yep, and I think I saw Wit's hand next, and you're already off speaker, so go ahead. And another thing I thought of, that kind of ties in with what Emma said is that since we're all viewed as sinners, God all views us all on the same kind of social class, not one's higher, one's lower, mm -hmm. one's a king, one's a peasant, that type of thing. Yeah. He's, he's able to eat with everybody. And you said that you typically only eat with people you liked or who were on your same social class or something like that. Yeah, well said. And it, it's kind of like, if we were all standing here in person, we would all be different heights, right? Mm -hmm. And we'd, we'd look around and say, okay, uh, one person is this tall and another person this tall and another person this tall, right? And to us, it seems like there's this big difference. But if somebody were flying a plane overhead, do you think they, like, we would all just be specs? We, yeah. they, they wouldn't, the difference wouldn't really matter. And it's kind of the same thing when God looks at us. He's like, you're all down there. You're all sinners. Um, and, you know, you can argue about, you know, somebody is, you know, a, a half an inch taller or whatever, or half an inch better with their, their sin. Um, but uh, you're all sinners. You all have the same problem. And I love you all the same anyway in Jesus. Yeah, Wes. Um, me, I would say God treats everyone uh, equally, it, as you were saying, is not. Oh, whoops. Rats. Okay. I think we lost him there, but Wes was making a really good, oh, there he is. He's back. Okay. Awesome, Wes. I was just, I don't know if you can hear me, but I was just saying you're starting to make a really good point. I think I know where you're going if you want to continue. Um, but as I was saying, it's the same thing you're saying. It's not, oh, this person sins more, so they're bad. It's everyone's equal. And the second thing is God is forgiving. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so God is forgiving. And what more could you want in a God than a God who's, who knows that we've done bad things 
he treats them seriously, but he also is forgiving. And he says, I'm going to fix those things in the world for you. Um, and then the first point Wes was making is, you know, God treats everyone equally in terms of, in terms of forgiving sin. Um, and now that said, that doesn't mean that there aren't some sins that are worse than others in terms of how they impact our neighbor, right? It hurts my neighbor a lot more if I punch them than if I um, steal a penny, right? Theoretically, does that make sense? Um, mm -hmm. yep. And so it's not that all sins are necessarily equal, but all sins um, have a need to be forgiven. And all sinners need to be, all sinners have a need to be forgiven, I mean. Um, and God treats us equally in Christ um, in showing us grace in that way, in terms of giving us his forgiveness. Very good. And last but not least, Emma, what are your impressions here? If you were going to summarize, um, like what, what, how you describe Jesus in this? or his kingdom with some adjectives? Um, so I had the idea, well, my idea was the same as Nina and Weston was um, forgiving. Because mm -hmm. I feel like ev everyone, like all people sin. So, and he like still died for us on the cross. So I think that like makes him very forgiving. Yeah, very good. And that's important too, because there are a lot of, people that look at Christians and they look at the God of scripture and they say, Oh, you know, you Christians are so mean and you know, you're so demanding and you're so legalistic and, and all that sort of stuff. And when we, it's important for us, even as Christians to remember that we have a forgiving God. And so we should be forgiving and patient and gracious too with people. Um, and not always so, um, not always so demanding and, and legalistic and things there. And, it, and that way too, we can also, we show that through our actions and we can also tell them that actually, you know, if you go through and read the gospels, just like Emma or that Mia was saying there, um, that we have a forgiving God who died on the cross for us. Very good. Thank you guys. Um, that was an important kind of recap, I think, for us. To, and those are the sorts of questions I want you to think about as we keep going is, you know, how would I describe Jesus to people in this, in a particular episode of scripture or story? You know, does he come across as strong or truthful or um, forgiving or those sorts of things, welcoming? Um, and how do I describe him altogether or his kingdom and what he's trying to do? Those are good questions. Now, um, finally, um, looking at this, this picture right here that we have, and I shouldn't have put that up quite so early, maybe, but it also kind of gets at some of what we've been talking about. Um, because we have a bunch of symbols here that actually remind us of the sort of Messiah, the sort of king that Jesus is. Um, and we, we talked earlier about how in man-made religion, man thinks that he can serve God, right? He thinks he can earn his way into God's good graces, earn God's favor. He thinks that he can use works of the law in order to get on God's good side. And that's just not true when you look at scripture. Um, it's not that man has to serve God to earn God's good graces. It's that we start off um, being shown grace by God all the way back at creation. And that God serves us. And um, those things only got interrupted because of the fall. But we never had to earn salvation, even in the Garden of Eden. We already had God's grace and favor before the fall without having to work for it. Um, we followed the law because that's a good way to love your neighbor. Yeah, Emma. 
Um, okay, so I have two things. Mm -hmm. So first for um, B, so I kind of just wrote like, uh, he dines with sinners, like Jesus dines with sinners. But I know the question was like, with whom did Jesus share table of fellowship? And mm -hmm. I was kind of like wondering, like, didn't he like do that with everyone because he's like, he loved everyone and yeah, pretty much. So okay. with, you can say with sinners or with, um, another good word to put there would be with nobodies. So Jesus, uh, eats with, or has fellowship with nobodies. Good clarification point there. And Jesus does that because he's a servant King. And we see there, you guys see this symbol on the screen of a man kneeling, the stick figure kneeling with a, a crown there. The crown reminds us, okay, it's a king. And then uh, the figure kneeling means he's a servant. And that's Jesus. He's a servant king. And he shows he's a servant king by the way he treats people, who he eats with, that he goes to the cross there and dies for us, and that um, he goes and rises from the dead as well. And that's supposed to be um, the outline of a tomb there to the right of the cross with the stone kind of rolled away from the entrance. If you guys can see that, that's a symbol for the tomb. Um, and, and so it's not about Jesus kingdom and being the Messiah. It's not about trying to give us more demands of the law. He's trying to return us to faith in God to forgive us our sins. Um, and to show us again what it means to love our neighbors. And that's all throughout scripture in the Old Testament. We just miss it sometimes. And even with the Ten Commandments, if you guys remember, way back when we looked at the Ten when God gave the Israelites the Ten Commandments, do you guys remember what the what commandments would be better translated as? Not the Ten Commandments, but the Ten, yeah, wit words was it yes very good the 10 words um that's the literal translation and the first of those words do you remember the first word wit i know i'm asking you to think way back what didn't he say something about bringing them up out of egypt exactly exactly um, and so god's who brought you out of egypt or something like that Perfect. Yeah. And so um, even the Ten Commandments, right, they help us love God and love our neighbors. But the first thing God says is, hey, I'm the God who rescues you. I'm the God who saves you, even when you don't deserve it, because I'm forgiving, I'm welcoming, all of those things. That's who he is all throughout scripture. And that's who Jesus is. And we get to see the image of the invisible God in Jesus. He shows us that. He's the, the word made flesh. Now, uh, kind of moving along here, we also see this figure uh, on this, this slide, or these couple of figures to the right, and we see Jesus washing Peter's feet. And maybe you guys remember that episode there where uh, it's at the Last Supper before Jesus goes to his death. And he goes and he acts like a servant because only servants would wash the feet of other people. Only servants or slaves did it. And Jesus goes ahead and he washes his disciples' feet, even though he's their better, their superior in every way. He, and they should be washing his feet. And yet he's going to do that for them. And it would be kind of like if all of a sudden, like right now you heard a knock on your door and the queen of England was there and she was like, oh yeah, I'm here to clean your house. And you would be like, no, 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 you don't need to clean my house. I'll come and clean your house. Right. But she insisted. And that's kind of what Jesus is doing here. He, he's going to serve you, even though He's the one that should be served. Um, so uh, that's the sort of, of king that Jesus is there. And that kind of gets at some of these, uh, these questions here. Um, 
and we can just go ahead and skip, uh, skipping down to 13C, right? What was the nature of the messianic age Jesus taught, lived out, and established? If you haven't figured it out, it's that um, it was one of service. He was a servant king. And a lot um, of people, yeah, go ahead. Uh, did we, so did we do the, finally, the question of identity? I was going to come to that right after. Oh, oh okay. I was, I was like, we're skipping down. Like, did I miss that? Yep. Nope. No, we, we just leapfrogged it and we'll come back to it in just a minute. Okay. So, thank you. Mm -hmm. And uh, so... Uh, but a lot of people were frustrated with this, and this is the answer to question two. Why were they frustrated by this definition of the Messianic age? Because they didn't want to be servants. And that's human nature, right? If you want to write down human nature is, we don't want to be servants. We want to be in power. We want to be served. We don't want to serve others. And they dislike this so much that they actually end up crucifying Jesus for it. And there are other factors too. We talked about some of that last week. But Jesus died for it. And yet, and this is the, the third answer there for the third question, God kind of confirms that this is actually the way Jesus presented the messianic kingdom is true. Because he, he raised Jesus from the dead. And if Jesus was a false Messiah, he wouldn't have raised him from the dead. So um, so basically, we just write, like, for the third question, like, God rose him from the dead? Yeah. And you can say, um, to a really simple way to say it is, God... Um, ensures Jesus' victory. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. And then we are going to, we're not going to worry about that fourth diamond there. Um, that ask in what way is illustration 13C a commentary, yada, yada, yada. We're not gonna worry about that one, okay? Um, but we, um, and then we're gonna, we're gonna move on to beginning to dig there on page 47. Um, and after we do those digging questions, then we'll go back to the questions about identity, okay? So uh, I want to look at question number one in beginning to dig, which says this. It says if illustration 13C, which um, is this one right here on the screen we're looking at, if this illustration were placed in the form of a large banner in a place everyone could see it in churches and worship facilities. What effect do you think it might have on the people who came there to worship? What do you think it would teach them or remind them of? Yeah, wit. I think it would remind them that we're supposed to be servants and Jesus was a servant king and that he died for us all. Yep. Very good. Very good. And you guys see the all the people there surrounding Jesus there. That represents the church. And we've got the Holy Spirit there too, empowering the church to be servants like Jesus served us. Um, and it's easy to forget that. Believe me, we all forget it all the time. I do too. 
and we think, oh, I, you know, I don't really want to do this for someone else. It's inconvenient. Uh, I'm not in the mood, yada, yada, yada. I'd rather be the one being served, if I'm being honest. But uh, as members of God's kingdom, that's helpful for us to remember. And we can do that because we remember we love because Jesus first loved us. All right. Now, um, lastly, then, um, skipping down to, I think we've kind of covered the rest of those digging deeper questions. We can see Jesus kind of flips the up, uh, flips the expectations for the kingdom around because nobody would have expected the king to be a servant, right? Um, you wouldn't expect the president of the United States to show up and clean your bathroom. That's just not going to happen. Um, and you wouldn't expect the Messiah to die on a cross for us either, but that's what Jesus did. And so getting back to those questions of identity, unfortunately we lost Emma and Mia, but we can answer this later for them, hopefully. But uh, according to when, when people are, Jesus asks his disciples, who do people say that I am? Because everybody's wondering who Jesus is. The people did not think Jesus was the Messiah. At best, they thought that he was kind of like a biblical figure, but they didn't think he was the Messiah because he just did was not meeting these expectations. They think there's no way a guy that's, you know, so humble and and serving people and all these sorts of things is the messiah the king right the king is going to be powerful he's going to be a mighty warlord he's going to make us rich he's going to do all this great stuff and instead you have jesus who um says no i'm going to go and die on a cross so they did not think that jesus was going to be the messiah now on the other hand the disciples, um, the disciples were a little bit better, and they say, you are the Messiah. They did believe Jesus was the Messiah. Um, they did believe that Jesus is the Messiah, but they, hello girls, welcome back. Hi, sorry, my computer died. No, that's okay. I, you know, power and all that sort of stuff, I figured. So, uh, so we're talking about the identity questions. And just real quick, the, um, the people had all these questions about who Jesus was, but they did not think he was the Messiah because he just didn't meet expectations. They would never expect the Messiah to be lowly, to be friends with sinners, to die on a cross. And the disciples thought, okay, we, we think this is the Messiah, but they still, even they thought that the kingdom was going to be a different type of kingdom, that it was going to be one of, you know, power and military might and all that sort of stuff, that it was just going to be one victory after another. And that's not how it turned out, obviously. Um, Jesus ultimately was victorious, but you have to go through the cross first. And it didn't end up in a mighty political kingdom or a country or something like that. It's a different type of kingdom. As Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. So um, moving on, does that all make sense? Do you guys have any questions or comments about any of that? Okay. Um, yeah. So um, I know that on the beginning to dig, um, I got one of the questions, but I don't know if I fully got the question. Um, so like I got, um, it will remind us that we are supposed to be servants, but um, I was going to ask, but I, but then my computer died. Yeah. So are you talking, Emma, you're talking about, um, the digging deeper question, right? If yeah. we had this banner up, what would it teach us? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it would remind us that we have a servant king. And so everybody in his kingdom is going to act like Jesus does. 
we're going to love each other. We're going to be humble. We're going to put others before ourselves. All those sorts of things. So, but if you want to summarize, it means we're going to act like the servant king. Okay, thank you. Yep. And we, and you know, that's not a a burden, something, right? We love because God first loved us. All right, so moving on to section 14 then. In the uh, few minutes we have left here. Uh, we're going to start talking about Jesus made all these claims. And so now we have to evaluate these claims, right? Does he back them up? And what do these claims say about the sort of authority that he has? What's the verdict, right? And you guys all know what a verdict is. A verdict is like when a, a judge rules, he makes a decision. So what's the verdict, the decision, the ruling on if Jesus is really the Messiah and what sort of power and authority he has? And we're going we're gonna to see kind of the conclusions we can reach based off of that. Yeah, Emma. Um, I don't know if we missed it or if we skipped um, the beginning to dig number two and then the digging deeper question. Yeah, we're not, we're not going to do those just for the sake of time. So we can skip oh, over those. Other okay, ones. thank so, you. Thanks for checking. All right. Uh, so looking at the verdict then in section 14, uh, and we've got this photo here we're going to dive into that'll help us kind of hopefully remember and pick apart some of this stuff here. So looking at this first photo, um, and you guys remember Mark is kind of interesting because he doesn't present Jesus as talking as much. He kind of just lets us form our conclusions about Jesus by telling us what Jesus did. He shows us who Jesus is rather than tells us a lot of times. Uh, and so Jesus in Mark's gospel reveals his identity as the Messiah through his actions, primarily, not through his words as much. So looking at this diagram, though, and the little symbols there, if you guys remember back to last week, um, each of those symbols is something that Christ showed his authority over, his power over. So do you guys remember what any of those symbols are and how Christ shows his authority over them? You can take any one you want. So we've got a, yeah, Nina, go ahead. It's like Jesus showing his power and authority like over sickness and death with the snake on the staff. Exactly. Very good. He heals a bunch of people. And you guys, I don't have a, a diagram here, but you may actually remember if just driving around and you see you know, medical icons and stuff for different groups, a lot of times they have a similar symbol with a snake going up around. It's from that there. So, so he shows his authority over illness and uh, sickness and ailments, those sorts of things. Emma, go ahead. Um, so I, I, I actually um, took the, did the answers on them. So um, for the, um, the white capped wave, uh -huh. wave, that's not the one that Nina did, right? Nope. Okay, just making sure I wasn't repeating it. Um, so I wrote like that it shows that, um, that like Jesus has power over like creation. Yeah, exactly. Yep. And that makes sense because Jesus is the creator, right? He's the son of God. He, and Jesus is not a creature. He's the creator. So he has power over creation. Very good. And then um, anybody else remember any of the others? Mia, do you remember what the the tombstone with the skull means, you can probably guess. Um, is it, does it stand for death? Yeah, it's a symbol for, 
for death. Very good. And Jesus raises some people from the dead, right? And so he shows his authority over, over death. And again, as the creator, God has authority over life. And that means he also has authority over death. Now, um, what about this last one, the mean looking face? Any ideas there? Yeah, Whit? Oh. Or Wes? Either one? You guys can both take this. Um, I was just about to ask, what does that mean? Yeah. Yeah, I know. And that's probably the trickiest one. Whit, you want to take a stab at it? That means Jesus has power over demonic forces. Yeah, so that's kind of the symbol for Satan, Wes, that we, and we introduced that, I think, last week. Um, and so that's a symbol for Satan and demonic forces, and Jesus cast out demons. So Jesus basically shows he has authority over all of these different parts of creation. And who has, a, now when you think about it, who has authority over all those different parts of creation? Who's the only person that has authority over all of those things? Yeah, go ahead. Jesus. Jesus, and um, uh, that's correct, but even more so, God, right? And so the fact that Jesus is doing these things should kind of have light, like for the people that were watching him, there should be light bulbs going off. Like, I thought only God could forgive sins, right? We talked about the, the paralyzed man who, and Jesus forgives his sins last week. And the religious leaders are like, hey, you can't do that. Only God can do it. And Jesus is like, well, I just did. And to prove it all, you know, I'll heal him so he can walk. And so they should be kind of being like, well, I thought only God could forgive sins. So what does that imply about this guy here? Oh, and light bulb, ding. He must be God. And he is. And so Jesus is showing that through all these different actions. Because nobody else does all these things there. Um, and even just the way Jesus talks about scripture is different. You know, other people might say, well, in Exodus, you know, such and such, this chapter, and Jesus speaks like he's the author of scripture. And he shows a command of it that nobody else shows. So that's important for us to, to take note of there. Now, moving on then to um, our next thing, our next little bit, you guys see those question marks there below Jesus. And that's because people had a lot of questions about who Jesus was. They didn't get it. They didn't quite know who he was. They didn't know what to make of him. And so just like Jesus asks his disciples, who do people say I am and who do you say I am? Right? They're trying to figure it all out. And these next couple illustrations are going to help us keep track of that. This first one here um, shows us that Jesus says, I'm the Messiah, right? He, or um, he, he, through his words and deeds, he tells people that he's the Messiah. But they don't understand what type of Messiah he's going to be. And they don't really like it when he tells them. Because Jesus tells them that he's going to go to the cross, that he's going to be killed by the religious leaders, um, that he's going to die and that he's going to rise again. And so in that question that we have here, um, uh, where did Jesus make these predictions? And they're predictions about his death, about his passion. And when we say his passion, um, that's just kind of a way of talking about his death and his resurrection, his suffering, death, and resurrection. Because um, the words suffering and passion are related there. But the, the first of these predictions takes place um, pretty early on in Mark 8, way back when. So it's not like the cross was a surprise to Jesus. It's not like he, you know, suddenly had to adjust his plans and work that in. Um, and that's on the way to 
Caesarea Philippi. And I'm going to spell that for you guys because I know that's kind of tough to spell. It's spelled C A E S A R E A space P H I L I P P I. And I'll say that again C A E S A R E A. And then Philippi is P H I L I. I P P I. And so that's where Jesus asked people, uh, his disciples, who do people say I am? Who do you think I am? And Jesus answers that he's the Messiah, but they don't really understand that because Jesus goes ahead and predicts his suffering and his death, his burial and his resurrection. And Peter doesn't like it. Peter actually tries to pull him aside and say, no, 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 Jesus, stop talking this way. You're scaring people. Stop it, Jesus. You're not going to die, Jesus. You're scaring your followers, right? You're supposed to be optimistic about how you're leading us, and you're telling us our leader is going to die. Stop doing that, Jesus. God will, God will protect you. That'll never happen to you. That couldn't possibly be God's plan for the Messiah, and all those sorts of things. That kind of, that's kind of Pastor Kyle's translation paraphrase there and filling it in a little bit um but jesus actually responds to peter by saying get behind me satan oh those are harsh words can you imagine if like pastor allen and i said that to one of you guys get behind me satan would be like <laughs> oh harsh right but that's what jesus says to peter right and um he says to him, you have in mind the things of man, not the things of God. Because God's plan and God's kingdom is for Jesus to be a suffering, a servant Messiah, who will go to die for our sins and to rise for our eternal life. He's going to deny himself for the sake of others. And uh, Jesus says, if you want to be like me, if you want to be in my, my kingdom, then you're going to pick up your cross and follow me. That's what it means to be a follower like me. You may not literally pick up a cross, right? But what do you think Jesus means by that? If he says, um, if you would follow after me, deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me. What, do, what does that mean? What does that look like for a Christian? Any thoughts on what Jesus is getting at there? Yeah, Emma. Um, I just have a quick question. Um, what dime, like what diamond are we on? Because I only got the Mark 8, uh, 27 through 38. And I was trying to figure out if we, um, had already done the Mark 9, 30 through 35, and then the Mark 10. We have not, no. So I'm just kind of wanting to talk about this with you guys first a little bit. Um, okay. So is, is there like any diamond that we're supposed to be answering on? Um, if you guys, you could kind of fill in um, how did the disciples respond to Jesus' passion predictions and what did Jesus in turn say to them, if you wanted, um, which is kind of what we're talking about right now a little bit, but um, you can kind of do that as we go too, because we'll be touching on it at different points. But basically the disciples, how did they respond to Jesus' passion predictions? Well, they're like, we don't like that. If you want to sum it up, um, we don't want that. And Jesus tells them, you can go with, uh, you can have it your way, or you can go with God's way. I could make a lame joke there about when man says no way, God says Yahweh. <laughs> All right, so I'll let you guys write that down real quickly. Uh, but so going back to what Jesus tells his disciples there, he says, if you want to follow me, deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me. What do you think 
Jesus means by that, because he probably doesn't mean that we're going to have to actually go and be crucified ourselves on a literal cross. So what do you think Jesus means by that? What does it mean to pick up your cross and follow Jesus? Kind of like you have to put yourself aside. You have to be a servant. You know, even if you get like prosecuted or whatever. Yeah, very good, Nina. So, and you put yourself aside um, so that you can focus on who? On God. On God, and that's true, and on who else? On your neighbors, I guess. Excellent, yeah. And so rather than thinking about me, 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 I, 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 right, we think, okay, I'm going to set aside, like you said, Nina, I'm going to set aside my own well-being, and I'm going to put the needs of my neighbors first. And Jesus says, that's kind of what it's like to be my disciple, is you you crucify your own desires, your own sinful desires, and you put other people first, just like he put us first when he went to the cross. And this all ties back into what we were talking about earlier about loving our neighbors, right? The two greatest commandments. You guys seeing how they're all kind of tying back together. You love God with all your heart and mind and soul and strength and love your neighbors as yourself. And even sacrifice for them like Jesus did sometimes. All right. So uh, continuing along here, the second time that Jesus makes a passion prediction is right after his transfiguration. You can see that big word spelled there. And I'll let you guys, what? Okay. Um, so it's right after his transfiguration, and I'll let you guys write that down, but um, what is the transfiguration? Does anybody remember what that is? What happened to Jesus at the transfiguration? It's a big word, I know. So you guys probably remember this event. But the transfiguration is when um, Peter, James, and John went up the side of a mountain with Jesus, and Jesus was transformed. He was transfigured before them, and he shone with incredible light, right, um, and was white as snow. Uh, the garments were white as snow and, and all these things, and um, the disciples were really impressed and terrified and it's where Peter says, uh, uh, Jesus, this is great, because Jesus is talking with Moses and Elijah. He says, this is great. How about we make three tents for you, uh, you know, one for you and one for them and one for us and yada, yada, yada. And he's babbling on because he's all nervous. You know, he's a nervous talker. And then the voice of God the Father comes in and he says, basically, Peter, shut up. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And what he has to say about who I am and about what sort of Messiah he is and what sort of kingdom he is. Don't listen to the world. And then the next thing they do, so Peter's just been told to listen to Jesus. The next thing they do is they, they leave the mountain. And what does Peter listen to? He listens to Jesus tell him for a second time that he's going to go to the cross. That he's going to die for humanity. So Peter's just kind of gotten scolded for not listening, and then he starts listening, and, and Peter says, okay, or Jesus says a second time, okay, are you listening now? I'm going to the cross. That's the sort of Messiah I'm going to be. Any thoughts or questions on that? Um, when you said to, like, write down the transfiguration, uh, where did you did like where did you want us to write that down? Because I couldn't find like a question, sure. like a question or yeah. Sorry, that is the um, so that's the second time, the Mark nine, the second time Jesus predicts oh. his passion, oh. and he just does it right after the transfiguration. 
And then the, okay, thank. You. Yep, you're welcome. And then Mark ten. Um, so that's a, the third time Jesus predicts this. Okay. Is um, is when he is going to uh, going into Jerusalem. There, he's on the way. Um, getting ready to go into Jerusalem. And he says again, again, that he's, this is what's going to happen. And the disciples really still don't get it, honestly, in each of these cases. Um, what they end there, Jesus is like, yeah, I'm, I'm about to go and die for all of you and for the sins of the world. And the disciples are like, yeah, yeah, that's cool, Jesus. Uh, but, uh, can we have important positions in your kingdom? You know, can we, you know, can you give us a nice office with a corner view? And, you know, can we sit on your right and on your left, Jesus? And Jesus is like, no, you guys, I just told you I'm going to die. And they're like, yeah, but can we have the big office with the swivelly chairs is basically what they're asking, right? They want important positions. They want power, all that sort of stuff. They just don't get it. They don't get it that, to, um, and you can maybe write this down on, on the margins. It's not a specific question. Um, and maybe you could go on the second diamond there. What did Jesus say to them? But you can say greatness in the kingdom equals being a servant. Greatness in the kingdom equals being a servant. And, you know, a scripture verse to describe this would be that the first will be last and the last will be first. Because things are kind of flip-flopped in God's kingdom, but in a good way. Now, I know we're, we're running a, a minute over, um, but just real quick, we'll finish up here. If you guys bear with me. You guys see, saw the eye that appeared in Mark. Jesus heals a blind man right before his first passion prediction. And then he also heals a blind man right after his third passion prediction. And it's almost like Mark is kind of telling us, hey guys, do you actually see who Jesus is? Are you listening to him? To what, who he says he is and what sort of Messiah, what sort of king he's going to be? You better, you better look. You better listen, um, or you might miss it. And uh, so often we want Christianity and the kingdom of God to be about power or, you know, being comfortable or health or wealth or all those sorts of things. And that's not what it's about. Um, it's bigger and it's better than that, even though it, in some ways it's also harder or seems harder. Yeah, Emma. Um. So on the last, it's not like a diamond, but it's like, to the left of the of the crucified Jesus, a man stands in a posture of praise. Um, are we supposed to write anything there? Um, yeah, we did not get that far, so we'll have to pick up there next time um, when we talk about the cross and and those sorts of things there, because we're um, over time. But mm -hmm. are, um, for the like the like how Jesus like. He's a blind man before and then after. Like, is there like a specific question we're supposed to answer or no? I believe there will be a question later on in unit 14 in that worksheet, but we will answer that next next time. Okay. Okay, thank you. It's I just keep mentioning the blind man uh, stuff because it's a theme in Mark, and I want you guys to be kind of thinking about it. And every time you see an eye like that, you can think about, oh yeah, Jesus was healing someone and um, kind of begging the question, do we actually see who Jesus is or are we blind? Um, and so we got to listen to Jesus and look at what he does and listen to what he says. Any other questions, guys? Very good class. I enjoyed uh, hearing your guys' thoughts and um comments. You guys are making really good connections. I'm, I'm very happy with the connections you're all making. So keep working on your memory work and just do, um, do one verse or one kind of piece at a time, right? And then keep working on it. Don't just 
jettison it, don't let it go after you're done because you have fewer verses, but you want to keep them all memorized in your long-term memory, okay? And let me know if you have any other questions or anything like that. Um, I'm happy to talk with you guys outside of class. But if not, I uh, hope you guys have a great rest of your evening and uh, that you all stay safe and warm and dry, okay? Blessings. Thank you. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. 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 Bye, Wes. Thank you.